Is it good? Good so far? Uh, I'm going to start off a, a bit, I wouldn't say casual, but I want to I'm going to make you work right at the start, just a little bit, and then, and then I'm going to talk for the whole time, I promise. Um, OK, so how many people in here, just show of hands, would consider yourself a machine learning expert, just so I know? All right, so you've like published a paper, you've developed a machine learning algorithm. Yeah, experts? OK. Um, how many would you consider yourself an aficionado? Do you understand the pros and cons of different techniques or can tweak an algorithm? You, you know this already? Anybody? Oh, yeah, OK. But don't be shy. I mean, this is, the feedback's no good if you don't raise your hand. So, uh, or just a practitioner, you're just really familiar with a lot of machine learning packages. Yeah, you can be more than one. Sure, yeah. I, I kind of consider these to be stacked. How many of you are, would consider yourself a newbie? Like maybe you just took a Coursera class, you read a book. Okay. And how many think this is science fiction? Don't be shy. Come on. OK, um, so I don't want to go backwards. That's no good. OK, so in appreciation of your effort there, I'm going to give you a little gift. Right? I know it's very exciting. Uh, so if you haven't already created yourself an account, please do so. When you register, you can put in the promotional code MLSEV, and you'll get a free one-month boosted subscription, I think. It's in the title there. Uh, if you have already registered, just hop into our support chat and say, give me the free subscription, and somebody will take care of it. It's no problem. Okay. Hopefully that code is live. I, I just asked somebody who said that's the code. I put it on the slide. I think I got it right. Um, otherwise, 200 people will be disappointed now. OK, so what is machine learning? Let's start with what is not machine learning. I always like to do things the wrong way. Uh, so it's not sentience. Sorry. OK, we're not talking about killer robots or generalized artificial intelligence or anything that has to do with the word singularity, as popular as, the are, as these topics are in Twitter. Um, right? So you know, there's lots of hype right now. Alpha goes zero beats a human. Uh, at Go, killer robots can't be far off. That was actually that was actually somebody's like tweet. They said that killer robots can't be far off. I was very disappointed to read that. Okay, so first of all, AlphaGo Zero is really impressive. I think you have to give credit where credit is due on this. Um, but there's no need to feel fear these killer robots being powered by AlphaGo Zero. The learning is not transferable, right? They trained this thing to play Go fantastically, but now you want to play chess, and guess what? You have to do. You have to retrain it. Okay, um, this works. This whole system works only for these rule-based systems with a perfect simulator, right? Where you know the rules of the game exactly, and you can simulate it. And now the machine can just sit there and play against itself until it finds optimum strategies. That doesn't really apply to a lot of things. And I love the quote there because that's from the CEO. Um, you know, it's a step towards general purpose AI. It can only work on problems that can be perfectly simulated. Um, the AIs that match humans at a range of tasks are still a long way off. Okay, so from the very creators of the project, no. Don't worry about this, right? It's not a killer robot kind of situation. And this is also a system that relies on games with a clear objective. You're winning or losing. There's no gray area, right? At the end of the day, you can say, I won. You lost. It also costs 25 million to play Go really well. OK, so let's just break this down into some big domains. So if we think about artificial intelligence, um, you could define artificial intelligence however you like. This is the one I like. This is cool, scary things that mostly don't exist. So anytime somebody's talking about artificial intelligence, they're just talking about things that we think might happen someday um, that could be really cool or scary. Okay, uh, Somewhere inside that world of artificial intelligence is a thing called machine learning. And these are AI concepts that are applied to very specific problems and actually work, and people are using them right now. Okay, And then even further down, by the way, there's this thing called deep learning, which you've probably heard about, which is yet again a specific technique of machine learning. OK, so don't conflate these. Don't think about neural networks being you know, the only thing that artificial intelligence is. and you know, these, They're all subsets of each other. OK, so it's not, also not something new. I came back to this slide. Um, the first international conference on machine learning was held in 1980, so this stuff's been going on for a while. All right, that was a while ago. And these top performing algorithms, the, the stuff we're going to tell you about, the thing people are using to solve amazing problems, they've all been around for decades. Okay, and some of them have been improved recently or have only become possible you know, with compute power and data sets. But they've, realistically, the algorithms themselves have been around forever. OK, so a little bit of a practical definition for you. Um, you know, we've got some flight data here. And we're going to use machine learning. And we're going to build some predictive models. And you could just say, 
Machine learning is finding patterns of data that could be used to make inferences. That's a very simple definition. Fair enough. We're on board with that. Okay. A little bit for terminology on the technical pr perspective. We're going to start with some kind of a data. Oh, I have a laser. Uh, and this data is going to be comprised of features and instances. So we call the rows of data instances. If each one is an instance. There's a reason for that. And you know, sometimes you're going to have a thing over here called a label, which you're going to need for supervised learning. And you're going to apply some machine learning algorithm that's going to give you some kind of a predictive model there. And you're going to use this model to put a new instance of data into the model and get a prediction out. And that prediction will typically come with some kind of associated confidence or probability. Right? Those are all terms you're going to see over and over. Uh, and you can swap out the, the kind of model there. And this workflow is basically the same. Um, more on the terminology, we call this side the training or the learning, and we call this side the predicting or the scoring. Right? Okay, so why? Why do you want to do this? Um, and hopefully we've, we've already hit a little bit on the business side, but from a technical side, this is maybe another way to think about it. Right? So computers are fantastic. We know this. Um, early computers were a little bit difficult to use, very hardwired, so to speak. Okay, and then obviously they've become really sophisticated, lots of nice compilers and really amazing things you can do, and libraries that do things out of the box. And I kind of like to think about machine learning as just a new paradigm in programming. You're programming with data instead of explicit rules. Okay, you're not writing explicit rules anymore, you're programming with your data. So this might be, uh, this was actually a joke slide made by our CEO when my luggage keeps getting lost every time I come to Spain. And I've kept it because I think it's actually very fitting. So this would be, you know, a, like a traditional lost baggage policy that you would might code in Python, right? Which says, you know, the, the uh, baggage finally arrived. You know, if they're a diamond level, then send it to them by express. Otherwise, send it by regular post, right? Just, I don't by mule or something. It took weeks to get my bag, it seemed like. Um, and if they're not even, you know, if the bag still isn't there, then you just send some apologies. But you're, again, you're writing these explicit rules, right? Very explicit. And the question is, how do we program when the rules are unknown or very difficult to determine? What do you do then? So here we have some flight data. Here's the airline, the origin, the destination, how long the flight was delayed, how long it was flying, and what the arrival delay was. And what you want, this is what you have, but what you want is just something that tells you, is this flight going to be delayed or not? And I don't really, I have the data, but I just want this result. And instead of trying to write explicit rules, thinking about flight delays and what, what causes them and what are the factors in where you're leaving from or where you're going to or how delayed you were. Instead of trying to figure out what all those rules are, you just hit it with some machine learning and then you have a flight delay model. Just like that, right from the data. No explicit rules need to be thought up. All right, so what else can machine learning do for us? Okay, the world of tasks that we can do in machine learning kind of break down into, well, they don't kind of, they do, into supervised learning. And the supervised learning space, we're going to call this classification and regression problems. And you'll see this again and again. Classification means you're typically predicting a label, all right, like red, green, blue, alpha, or uh, giraffe, zebra, hippo, or something. It's a list of things. And regression means you're predicting something's numeric. Okay, you owe me $30, $50. Uh, and then there's also time series, which are just kind of glue in over there as well. Okay, which is also something where you're predicting a future event, but you have labeled data again. And if you don't have labeled data, then you're talking about unsupervised stuff. And we're, then we're talking about things like cluster analysis or anomaly detection or association discovery or topic modeling for doing text analysis. Okay, and these are all things that you're going to see over the next two days. So as an example of what those actually mean, if you were thinking about a problem in predictive maintenance, then a classification problem might be, will this component fail? It's true or false. Will it fail? Okay. Uh, whereas the regression would be how many days until it fails. Tell me it's going to be three days, 16 days, or whatever. Uh, if it was time series, you might say how many will fail in a week from now. Forecast how many of these parts will fail. Whereas the cluster analysis, you're thinking about which of these machines are behaving similarly. Right? This one's vibrating a lot. This one's vibrating a little. Okay, anomaly detection, is this beha behavior normal? Should it be vibrating at all? Okay, that would be anomaly detection. And then association discovery, you know, what alerts are triggered that don't seem associated, but actually are? You know, so we could look at, oh, I got this series of alerts, and then suddenly there was a failure. So that is, find that association for you. Okay, in another space, maybe we could think about personalizing music. So classification, will, will this song be a hit? True or false? Right, regression, how many users will play this song next month? Um, time series forecasting, how many downloads? 
uh, cluster analysis, which songs are actually similar, okay? Is the song being played by normal, or what songs do people like to play together? Okay, I won't read every one, so we'll just we'll speed up a little bit here. But you can imagine perhaps an airline revenue management, right? Will this flight be booked at 80% 14 days out? True or false? That's a classification. Um, maybe an anomaly detection here we have, are these flight booking patterns normal? All right, another example of applying these different kinds of machine learning algorithms in the airline revenue management space. Uh, network security, a little closer to home for me, right? Is this email part of a phishing attack, true or false? How many logins after work per week? That would be a regression. Okay, are these users behaving similarly? I actually have some great stories about analyzing um, bash history for this kind of stuff. That's fun. Uh, anyways, um, the next thing that I, I'm, I'm moving a little quick, I'm sorry, because I'm doing, I'm your how today, by the way. Uh, but I don't want to delay coffee, so I'm going to keep it going fast. Okay, so all machine learning models are wrong. That's a very important thing, but somehow, okay. So here, what we're looking at, I have to explain a little bit. So here we have four different models, a decision tree, logistic regression, a neural network, and an ensemble. They're all using the same data set to make a prediction. And so we're looking at two dimensions here, two variables. In this case, it's actually like a BMI and a two-hour glucose test. And it's looking at predicting whether or not patients are going to have diabetes or not. So for this model, everything is blue. These are patients that this decision tree doesn't think they'll have diabetes. And over here, it does. And these other colors are somewhere in between. So you're looking at decision boundary, all right? So same data set, different models, and you can see how different this decision boundary is, right? Each model has a different perspective of whether or not these patients or which patients are going to have diabetes or not. And so if we just think about the same patient in each model, well, in this model, you're fine, and in that model, you're not, and in those two, you're probably fine as well. <laughs> okay, so, you know, some of the, one of these models must be wrong, right? They can't all... That this patient is provable either has diabetes or not. So there's something going on here. Um, but that's okay. Don't worry about that too much. Yes? So w the idea here, though, is that we need a better way to measure the model fitness. We need to know how we're understanding this fit to these patients so that we know which model we're going to be willing to trust. And more rigorously, we can do an evaluation. So in an evaluation, we would take the data, we would do some kind of a split. We take some patients out. We train the model with that. We take the rest of the patients out. We don't train it with that. And we use those to test it later. And then we can actually see how well this model does with these other patients that it never learned about during training. And this will give us some confidence. And you're going to see this again when we talk about evaluations later. All right, but this is just a general idea to keep in mind that your model is going to make mistakes. I'm going to skip that. Oh, I'm going to skip that too. That's fun, but we'll, it's a really great animation. Um, nah, we'll go faster here. Okay. It is important, though, to think about mistakes being, can be costly. Okay? Uh, so this, thinking about m machine learning mistakes is important. So this is, um, if you know this adversarial networks, the idea is can you fool a neural network that has been designed to recognize images? And so you send it that picture on the left there, and it says that's a dog. And you add in that little bit of noise there, which that picture on the right is that same picture, but with the noise added. So it doesn't look different to you, right? Everybody would agree the picture on the left and right look the same. OK, but the algorithm says that's an ostrich. OK, um, so that, that's super fun, right? Good times for everybody. Uh, unless you do this, then that's super bad times for everybody, right? Because now your self-driving car uh, doesn't recognize the stop sign anymore. OK, and this actually has been done, too. I've seen a couple of examples where they take a stop sign, they just put some weird looking stickers on it, and then suddenly it thinks it's a yield sign. So that's a real, a real problem. So you need a way to measure the expense of these mistakes as well. I mean, sometimes if you're making an image classifier, like I said, you don't really care about the mistakes, but if you're making a self-driving car, you probably care a lot. Uh, and so this is something that you'll see in the evaluations as well. You make these curves, and you have this question of, um, so this is like your false positive rate and your true positive rate, and the question is, these models are both making mistakes at some rate. Okay, I didn't give, do a very good job of explaining that, but you know, how do you choose which one is better in this case? And it comes down to, do you, do you like false positives more or do you like you know, false negatives more? <laughs> right? What is the cost of predicting that you have cancer and it turns out you don't versus predicting that you don't and that you do? Right? One has a much more serious outcome. Uh, and so one thing you can do is you can just think about taking ratios. Um, yeah, so this is my example. 
what is the cost of labeling a fraudulent transaction? That actually might be very easy to calculate precisely. Right? You could say, if we label these all wrong, it costs us $3 million. If we could catch them all, we could save that $3 million. So anyways. Um, but also, you know, what is the cost of predicting an aircraft part is safe? It's also a very expensive mistake you can make. Um, why can't you just have a perfect model? That's a good question. So the two ways that this is going to go wrong is something called overfitting and underfitting. And now we'll do some more pictures. So this is a hunting dog image classifier. All right, so here are some nice looking dogs. Okay, so which images are pictures of dogs that are bred to be hunters? And I actually, I have no idea. I'm not a dog expert by any measure. Um, but I will tell you, these are all false and these are all true. Okay, so the top row is all true. And so we could try building a model. Let's imagine our model just predicts that hunting dogs are short-haired spotted puppies that lay out in the grass. Okay, so if we do that, it gets them all right. Okay, those are all, those all match that criteria. They're correct, those are hunting dogs, and these ones are not. Okay, perfect. This is a perfect model. It's absolutely perfect. Do you agree? Right, I mean, it's got every single one of these images correct. Okay, um, so let's try some new images. So, you know, spotted lying out in the grass there, pointy ears and everything. Uh, so the model says that's a hunting dog. Reality, of course, is false. Uh, here's another one, not lying in the grass, not a hunting dog, but of course that actually is. Okay, so this is an example of poor generalization. The model fit the training data perfectly, but it doesn't generally generalize to new instances as well. So when we put it out, this model out into the real world, it fails more often than we might like, even though in the lab it looked like it was going to be perfect. Okay. So we could change this a little bit. Let's just focus on using the ear shape. So dogs with drop or pendant ears are hunters. All right. So now we, we got these all correct again on the ear shape, but we're making one mistake here, or actually two mistakes, sorry. So we're allowing this model to make mistakes. Okay, we're changing the rule so that in our training data, we accept some mistakes in the training data. And if we do this, it's an imperfect model. Okay, we're allowing the model to make mistakes, but now it's going to get those two correct. So when we put it on the real world, it generalizes better. All right, this is exactly, this is an example of good generalization. We underfit the training data. We did not match the training data perfectly, but in the real world, it generalizes better. Okay? Um, but of course, you know, that's not perfect either. All right, you, we could play this game all day. Uh, that one's definitely a hunter. Okay. So if you, if you prefer graphs, if you have lots of math classes or you're not math phobic, I, I, for some reason I prefer thinking about this as lines. Like if, if that curve there was a data set that you were trying to fit, you tried to fit a line, then we would call that underfitting, right? The line doesn't really match that curve very well. It hits it in a few places. It's kind of right, but it's miserable otherwise. And if you think about fitting that line over there, it's got those little blips down there. And you're like, I really care about those blips, so I'm going to make this black line as my model and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to account for those little blips. That's essentially overfitting, right? You're looking at the, the, the data you're trying to model and you're fitting every little nook and cranny of it. Uh, and so this is a low complexity model. This is just a line, it's very simple. This is a high complexity model. I mean, this would be, I challenge you to write the polynomial function for that model. Um, it's a bit involved. Okay, this is not fitting the data very well and this is fitting the data you might say too well, right? I mean, what, what should actually be the prediction here, right? How should this model generalize? Okay. So one way you can mitigate this is using different kinds of models, which is something you're going to see a lot of. So choosing the machine learning algorithm. Um, little guideline here. So on this axis, we're going to talk about decreasing interpretability. That means your ability to understand the model. Uh, better representation. This means better ability to fit complex data, okay? Or longer training time, how long you're going to wait for it to train. And on this axis, we have increasing data size or complexity. So do you have a really small data set or it's simple? That would be down here. Or it's really big or super complicated, lots of text fields up here. Okay, so I, I like to think of this in three stages. You've got the early stage where you're just playing around. You just want to see if your, your problem is going to be solvable with machine learning at all. Early stage, rapid prototyping. You're going to be thinking about logistic regression, okay, and sim single tree models, okay? They're very interpretable, very quick, very good to see whether or not something's going to work. Now you've got a proven application. You know there's some value in this. You know you can predict churn. You know you can predict cancer, whatever it is you're predicting and you want more representational power and you're willing to pay the price of longer training and lose some of this interpretability, then you can start thinking about these ensemble methods, which we're gonna see this afternoon. And then late stage, critical performance. I want absolute top-notch performance because I don't wanna let any fraudulent transactions go through or I don't wanna let any cancer patients walk home thinking they're fine. 
then you're going to be thinking about some of these uh, boosted tree ensemble methods or these deep neural, deep neural networks if you have, you know, large data sets or complex data. Okay? And you also don't have to think about this at all. You can also do this with automated machine learning. <laughs> okay? And you can start right here by saying, aren't these deep nets hard? And I would say, f generally, right? Because how do you build a neural network? You've got all these layers, and you know how many nodes do you put in each layer? What activation function do you want to do? And it's a giant quagmire of possibilities. Okay, and you you have to get it right. Um, it, the success is depending on getting that structure right. And there's too many parameters, these nodes, the layers, and, and you have to be an expert. And so you don't. You don't have to be an expert, right? There are ways to approach this problem using machine learning itself, uh, which is what we've done. And you'll see the example. I don't want to give it away too much. But we have two techniques. One is meta-learning, where we start with a good initial guess. We just look at your data and go, this is what your network probably should be. And then we also have another technique we can do where let's do this network search, where we try a bunch of strategy or different networks and uh, look at their performance and use that to predict which network structure will be the best in the future. And if you do that, you get this really fantastic graph, which that's Charlie's page, by the way, uh, you know, where this is a top performing algorithm for off the shelf. Our neural networks, you run it one click, boom, you get this. Fantastic performance. Okay, not quite one click, but okay. So the key insight here is that we can solve any parameter selection problem in a similar way, right? Each resource has several several parameters. Uh, if I want to build an ensemble, how many trees? Um, you know, how deep should the tree be? How many nodes? And rather than trial and error, we can use machine learning to find the ideal parameters here. So why not just go all out and make the actual selection of the algorithm a parameter as well? Do you want a decision tree, a boosted tree, or a deep net? Well, that's a parameter too. We'll just consider the whole parameter space to include the model type as well. All right, so similar to doing that deep ne neural network search, but we're looking across algorithms as well, and so we provide this as well. This is something we call Optimal. So you can just give it a data set, and you can say, I don't really care what model it is, just make it the best you can, and it will go through and find it for you. All right, it'll parameterize all of these models for you. You can go one step further, and then you can take those top performers, because actually can return a bunch of models. They'll say, these ones work really well. And you can start gluing them together into what we call fusions. So you can take uh, an ensemble and mix it together with a neural network and a logistic regression. You can make a new model that's a model of models. All right, why would you do that? Um, well, the idea is you get different effects in your data. Uh, I'm gonna talk about this a bit more in the fusions class too, but for, uh, for a very simple example, um, or basically, some machine learning algorithms generally do better on some feature types. So like, for example, a random decision forest for sparse text is typically performs better. And you know, logistic regression or deep nets for numeric features or trees for categorical. So you can think about splitting your data set into different features and doing different kinds of models and then fusing them back together. There's all these little tricks you could play. Okay, a summary on this one. And then, I'm, oof, this is gonna be a quick second one. Okay. Uh, so machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. We're finding patterns in data that can be used to make inferences. It can be thought of programming with data. It's been around for a long time. It's only recently become practical due to the availability of data uh, and fast computation and a few advances in how those algorithms are applied. It's already being used to solve real world problems though. All right, this is a, this is a fact. Um, caveat emptor, these machine learning mistakes are expected. In some, in some regard, you actually encourage them so that you generalize better. Care must be taken to address the cost of mistakes. What mistakes are you making? and how are they impacting the, uh, the model. And you can automate a lot of machine learnings, right? It's a powerful application of machine learning to parameterizing machine learning is a very, uh, I, I don't want to call it cutting edge, but this is, this, is, this is what the cool kids are doing, okay? Uh, and models can be fused together to address specific data complexities as well. So it's another very powerful technique.